Thank you all for attending today's webinar. I'm Emma Gleeson, Assistant Secretary of the Aged Care Workforce Branch at the Department of Health and Aged Care. I will be co-hosting this event with Tom Barendorf, Assistant Secretary of the Apprenticeships Operations Branch at the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations, or DUA for short. This is the second webinar in our employment, in our employer engagement series. Today's webinar will explain how aged care providers can use Australian apprenticeships to develop their workforce and describe the supports available. We have invited a number of aged care sector representatives along as guest speakers to share their real world experiences of the program with you. We would like to ensure that at the end of this session, you have enough information to be able to link in with your DUA representatives to seek further assistance to access this program. But first of all, I would like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We acknowledge the traditional owners on whose land we meet today. We pay our respects to elders past and present. We are based in Canberra today in Ngunnawal country, but I acknowledge that many of you are meeting from diff across different parts of Australia. So some quick housekeeping before I hand over to our DUA colleagues. There will be a 20 minute Q&A session at the end of the presentations for you to ask questions of the presenters and guest speakers. There will be an opportunity to post questions throughout the session via the question submission box on your screen. We will prioritise questions behind the scenes and post the ones we are responding to on your screen. There is no option for attendees to turn on their video or microphone. However, the session will be recorded and published. Upon completion of this webinar, a short survey will pop up in your screen. We encourage you to complete the survey to assist us making improvements to upcoming webinars as part of our employer engagement series. I would like to now introduce you to Tom and his team from DUA, who will lead you through the remainder of the session. Emma? Okay. Um, uh, if, my name is Tom Barendorf. I'm from the um, Apprenticeships Operations Branch at DUA, and we look after the delivery of Commonwealth Apprenticeship in Incentives and Support Programs. So um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the lands with which we meet and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, today I'll be talking to you about Australian apprenticeships in the aged care industry and why you should consider offering this as a pathway um, to attract staff and skill your workforce. So as part of that I'll bust a key myth about apprenticeships. Um, um, I'll also talk about the support available to employers um, and Australian apprentices in the aged care industry. And um, I'll also talk about um, uh, um, uh, um, where, um, where to next if you are thinking that this is a good opportunity for you and you'd like to uh, look to, to bring some apprentices on board. Um, uh, um, and as mentioned, yeah, there will be a QA and a session to it at the end of today's uh, uh, webinar, so you can ask myself, um, um, uh, um, Australian uh, or some employers and, and some Australian apprentices um, uh, some questions if you've got any. Um, uh, so yeah, please do uh, lodge any questions in the Q and A uh, in the group chat. Righto. Okay. Um, the key myth that we want to bust. Um, uh, so apprenticeships or Australian apprenticeships, as we like to call them uh, in the Australian government, are not just traditional trades. So. Um, Australian apprenticeships cover any employment arrangement delivered through a contract of training, including uh, many things often described as traineeships. So there can be a bit of confusion um, between what a traineeship and what an Australian apprenticeship uh, is. Um, uh, traineeships, um, uh, well, um, uh, the Cert 3 in individual support um, uh, is a traineeship. Um, uh, and so um, there can be some confusion about whether it's an apprenticeship or not, but they're the same thing as long as there's a contract of training in place. So um, what differentiates uh, an apprenticeship from other types of employment and training arrangements is the mix between formal employment, so um, the ability to earn an income, um, uh, on-the-job training, study, um, uh, which you can undertake while working towards a nationally recognised qualification. And as I mentioned, all this is underpinned by a contract of training. So it's the blending of multiple ways of learning uh, that can be particularly beneficial for learning and development outcomes for particular people. So, 
um, you know, getting practical experience, getting some formal training, and then also getting that on-the-job training. And for a lot of people, that's a really successful way of learning uh, and, and improving their skills. Um, uh, I should just point out that the um, uh, those those arrangements for apprenticeships um, and the approval and uh, uh, and the control of, of what is an apprenticeship is is managed by the state government. Uh, apprenticeship and traineeship legislation. So there's a bit of a crossover between the Commonwealth role and the state and territory role, um, but I won't go into that too much more. So just to mention, um, uh, um, Australian apprenticeships can be delivered and are delivered in the aged care industry. It's a very popular pathway. Um, in the most recent reporting period, just over four and a half thousand apprentices, there were just over four and a half thousand apprentices in the aged care industry. Um, uh, most of uh, those apprenticeships uh, are women aged 25 to 44. Um, and some good news is that apprenticeship completion rates, which the government's very focused on um, uh, for Australian apprenticeships in, in, in this industry are significantly higher than the average with over two thirds of aged care apprentices uh, successfully completing their training. So that's good news for employers. If, if, if your employee starts an apprenticeship, they're more likely to complete than, than other apprentices in different sectors. Um, uh, and um, uh, something that which is, is probably no so, a surprise to you all, um, the, ele the level of employment and demand for workers in the industry has significantly increased in recent times. Um, uh, uh, and yeah, as employers in the, in the aged care sector, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that, but um, clearly uh, that demand is important from a policy perspective. Uh, because we need to find ways to make it attractive for employees to work in the aged care sector and meet that demand so that uh, we can we can provide that vital aged care uh, support. Um, uh, a key part of that meeting that demand is to encourage employers to use pathways like Australian apprenticeships uh, to make it as attractive as possible for individuals to work in the sector and to undertake and stay in an Australian apprenticeship. So um, uh, why should you offer a CERT 3 in individual support for Australian apprenticeships um, as a pathway uh, to attracting and retraining staff? Well, firstly, um, it gives employers more control over the availability of skilled staff to your business, um, particularly at the moment when labour is very tight. Um, uh, you know very well that qualified candidates don't grow on trees. Um, so taking on staff through an apprenticeship pathway and seeing that through to completion uh, effectively gives you access to more qualified candidates through helping to develop them uh, yourself uh, and building a strong connection with uh, employees, which is which is critical. Um, uh, drawing on that point, there's plenty of research internationally which links um, investment, whether that's time or money, um, investment in training to staff, um, uh, uh, to top to higher job satisfaction, productivity, improved uh, work quality, and increased motivation and commitment. Um, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, better skilled, motivated staff lead to better care and better aged care outcomes, which is, is what we're trying to achieve. Um, there are benefits to the individual who undertakes the Australian apprenticeship pathway as well. Um, first off, uh, though some people may um, go into an Australian apprenticeship um, as just another job, um, if they see it through to completion, it does provide them um, with a career at the end of that outcome, which is a big thing for a lot of people um, uh, and uh, um, an Im important thing. Um, the latest data tells us that after successfully completing um, their apprenticeship in community and personal services um, occupations, such as aged care, around 89% of trainees are employed either straight away or within the first few months. So that's another key statistic which highlights you know, um, the importance of these uh, kinds of training pathways because it makes you very employable um, uh, at the end of them. Uh, and that's for good reason. Um, uh, of course, along with uh, career, um, successful completion of Australian apprenticeship will give individuals better pay, more opportunity to explore the roles in the industries and things like that. And uh, if people do enjoy it as a studying and um, uh, learning pathway, um, they can articulate to further learning in the industry, whether that's just upgrading to a cert four qualification or maybe even going right through to university. But um, for a lot of people, it's the beginning of a, um, uh, an education journey. So um, that's a really important thing for the individual as well. Um, and I suppose the other point to um, uh, with achieving qualifications like that is it's really good for the employee's wellbeing. Um, I think anybody who's undertaken some training or 
um, some study and, and got through it and you do feel a great sense of well-being. So that's good for staff as well. So um, there's plenty of good reasons for the employer and individuals to undertake it. And so the government um, thinks that that's worth um, uh, trying to promote. Um, uh, so to encourage employers and apprentices to maximise those benefits, there's a range of financial support the Commonwealth um, uh, uh, provide to make it more attractive to start and support Australian apprenticeships. Um, there's also a range of non-financial support uh, to apprentices and employers. Um, uh, and you can also get some state government uh, support as well for the training. In terms of financial support, um, uh, these are administered through the Australian Apprenticeship Incentive System and my branch helps to do that. Um, uh, so under the incentive system, financial support is, is targeted um, to priority occupations. Um, so the good news for the aged care uh, sector is that you are a priority occupation. So this means that you're eligible for um, uh, um, uh, to attract the priority wage subsidy, which pays a subsidy of 10% of wages paid in the first two years of an Australian apprenticeship and 5% in a third. So that's, that's assistance that goes to the employer. Um, apprentices themselves are also eligible for some support through the Australian Apprenticeship Training Support Payment which is a $1,250 payment every six months for the first two years of an Australian apprenticeship. So in practical terms, this means that for a 12 month certificate three in, indi in, in individual support, an employer will receive around $3,500 in wage subsidy. Um, that is dependent on, on wages, obviously. Um, different employers will pay different amounts. Um, and there's a maximum of $6,000 that you can receive. Um, and this is on top of any support you'd receive from the state or, or territory government um, as well. Um, over the same uh, period, an, an apprentice would receive around $2,500 in, in support. So um, a key part of providing uh, assistance to, to the apprentice um, is because um, uh, um, uh, we know that there are financial issues um, uh, that people face while undertaking Australian apprenticeships, uh, which impact their completion. So um, providing some incentives to the, to the apprentice as well can help them meet the cost of living and stay in training, which I think is a really important uh, outcome. Uh, there's some other uh, 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 assistance as well, which I won't go into too much, but um, uh, um, uh, um, apprentices that have to leave home uh, or move more than 90 minutes away to take advantage of a um, apprenticeship, they might be able to access a living away from home allowance. Um, and also there are currently some trade support loans available uh, to help with the cost of living as well. Now, um, there's currently some legislation that's going through the parliament that will broaden access to, or, or retarget the access for those loans. So um, uh, apprentices in the aged care sector, if that legislation passes, um, they should have better access to those loans. Um, uh, so it's a bit like a HEC scheme. Um, uh, where you're able to receive some funding um, and it's an income contingent so you don't have to start paying it back until you receive a certain level of income. So there's another uh, couple of uh, bits of assistance that the apprentice can also get. Um, so a bit of a segue here. So um, uh, um, to help access those incentives, there's a network of Australian Apprenticeship Support, uh, called the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network. Um, uh, and there are a network of providers that can help you right from day one to access those incentives. Um, uh, and we're going to hear from a, one of those providers a bit later today. Um, so the ASINs are contracted by um, the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations and get, uh, um, give personal advice, advice and support services from pre-commencement to completion of apprenticeships. So they help um, identify training opportunities um, uh, for apprentices. They help uh, businesses and employers to find suitable candidates. Um, they undertake a sign up and the lodgement of relevant paperwork uh, with state governments and they help you with Australian uh, as a, and, and, and as, um, any apprentices that you're working with understand your rights and responsibilities. Um, but critically they can help you claim the incentives that I was just talking about. So um, uh, they're a critical part of the, the network um, uh, and that's why we'll hear a bit more from them uh, later on. So another thing, um, uh, uh, on, on top of those supports, um, the um, um, provider network um, provide a range of non-financial support uh, to Australian apprentices. So these fall into two broad categories. 
uh, we call it gateway services and in training support. So gateway services are provided to prospective Australian apprentices and employers um, uh, of apprentices when they're not sure of the pathway to use or in the case of individuals not sure what industry they are suited to. Um, uh, the network providers have a variety of tools to help those um, individuals test their aptitude and the stream um, uh, and to stream them accordingly. And um, if you as an employer um, uh, reach out to the, the network providers, and let them know um, you have vacancies, they can help you match aged care suitable apprentices to your business. So if you are looking for people, they can help you with that. Um, so that's gateway services. The in-training support services um, are designed for employers and apprentices after they've started their um, uh, apprenticeship and, and uh, their uh, relationship. Um, uh, the providers um, where they identify an issue um, that may impact on the chances of the apprentice completing successfully, they can get in and help. So um, uh, um, the support itself can take on a number of forms such as pastoral care, mentoring or career guidance and is intended to address the needs um, of the situation and support the apprentice uh, through to successful completion. Um, uh, to me, um, the way I sort of think about that is a bit like a career counsellor or something like that, uh, that you might have had at high school um, or um, if you've undertaken a university degree, someone that you can go and talk to when you're struggling um, with your study or, or whatnot. So it's not exactly the same, but it's similar um, uh, in my mind anyway. Um, so the reason that they, we provide these supports is that research tells us that workplace issues around relationships between employers and apprenticeships are the number one reason why apprentices um, end unsuccessfully. So they're having a bad relationship with their employer or they're not um, feeling comfortable in the workplace and um, that's when they tend to, to not complete. So um, that's a really uh, key, the in-training support is a really key part of addressing that um, and can help employers and apprentices, apprentices navigate those issues. Um, uh, and we know that this service leads to significantly improved chances of retention and completion for Australian apprentices. So that's why we, uh, we support the uh, network providers to, to provide that. Um, so uh, how do you get started? So it's pretty easy. Uh, if you are interested in uh, um, looking to take on board some Australian apprentices and take advantage of uh, some of the incentives and the support that's provided by the Commonwealth and state and territory governments, um, the easiest thing to do is just go to the Australian Apprenticeships website um, and that will give you the contact details for one of the network providers in your region and they can help you with um, every step of the apprenticeship process. Um, so if you are interested, jump online and, and have a look. Um, now, I will just sort of jump to another slide. I probably could have talked about this a bit earlier in the, in the piece, but I should, um, I should flag too that as part of a, a, an apprenticeship, um, uh, there are some responsibilities for uh, employers as well. And I won't go on about these too much, but um, the, the, the first one um, uh, is unsurprisingly that um, uh, um, you have to ensure that your apprentice is employed and paid in line with relevant awards and, and agreements, um, uh, but you have to do that for all um, employees. So um, I think that one's um, pretty well understood. Um, uh, the second thing is, um, uh, depending on the arrangement you have with your training organisation, um, you need to give Australian apprentices time off to attend on the job training. So traditionally this might have been in a classroom at your local TAFE, um, particularly post-COVID, training organisations are delivering off the job training using a variety of different methods. So it's not always in that format anymore. Um, and the third thing which sort of leads back to that um, in training support, which I was talking to you about before, um, you need to ensure that your Australian apprentice is appropriately supervised in the, the workplace. So this one's really important. Um, uh, it's important that you have the right supervisor um, uh, to support the apprenticeship um, and apply what they're learning in the classroom to the workplace. So. Um, the network providers can help you understand that responsibility and that's made clear as part of any um, training agreement that you put in place. Um, uh, and so we just thought we'd, uh, we'd better let you know that there are some responsibilities for you as well. Um, now, I'd like to hand over to uh, Liliana Mussolino from MEGT, who's one of the seven um, network providers. Um, and she can talk to you a little bit more about um, the assistance that they can provide and roles and responsibilities and, and other things. So thanks very much. Thanks, Tom, and thank you to the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations and the Department of Health and Other Services 
interesting this webinar. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Liliana Mussolino, and I'm the manager of National Climate Services at CGT. I work with the national team across Australia, delivering the Australian Apprenticeship Support Network Services, otherwise known as the ASIN Services. The ASIN is your first point of contact for all queries about apprenticeships and traineeships. Um, we are contracted to the Australian government to provide a streamlined service for employers, for apprentices and their trainees um, and job seekers alike to access the um, quality Australian apprenticeships. And our services are free and we act as a facilitator between all employers, uh, Australian apprentices and trainees, the state training authority, registered training organisations, also known as the RTA, um, and the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. So for a quick overview of what we do and how we support you, we work with you individually, whether you are a small or large aged and healthcare provider, and support you in building a sustainable way Providing personalised advice and support services from pre-commencement to completion. Um, we are uh, we do recognise that every employer is different, um, so we deliver our support with a tailored and flexible approach that allows you to access a full range of services. So, in um, working with many employers within the industry, we're aware of some of the challenges faced, but we're here to assist you. We know that there's a lot of information. About apprenticeships and traineeships and employers say that they don't know where to begin. Um, we are aware about challenges with recruitment, um, staff shortages and challenges with trainee supervision support. At MEDT we strive to make the whole process as easy as possible for you. We share insights and ideas um, from our 40 years of experience working um, within the industry and providing workforce solutions for our employers. For example, we know that having a uh, company-wide buy-in from all management is vital um, for the success of the training program. We have found success in holding uh, information sessions or small group meetings with everyone involved in the process within the business. Um, and those information sessions, we we talk about um, what our friendships are, and what their roles and responsibilities are for everyone involved in the whole process. We can talk to we can talk to all tiers of managers from the exec level within the organisation through to ops managers and staff managers, L&D and HR managers, if they're the ones that are managing the training program within your business. Um, so the other part, the other feedback as well we've received is supervision being a challenge um, for many employers. A good example of how some of our employers have um, overcome this is where they've been able to start trainees in groups or have a uh, buddy system. Um, so what we find is that their support network is each other. Uh, trainees who have a great success rate of retention and completion are those that are, aren't isolation, in isolation or um, being fit on the training in the workplace. So through other feedback we've received from employees as well, um, we've heard a struggle with recruitment needs. Um, we try to utilise as many of the uh, more, many avenues that are available to them. As, as Tom mentioned earlier. There is the um, ASIN Gateway Services. It's a free recruitment support designed to test and stream and match trainees with employers. Um, at MEDT, for instance, we um, advertise the vacancies through our Career Hub services on our website. They are picked up on Indeed and Dora. Um, and in some instances where we need to expand the candidate attraction, um, we market the vacancies on our social um, media, such as Facebook um, and Instagram. We also promote um, the vacancies um, and engage and collaborate with other services within the sector, such as Workforce Australia Employment Services, registered training organisations um, as the RTOs, group training organisations, which is the GTOs, and our home care workforce um, support providers and schools as well. So not only to identify um, the, a, a, an, in, an increased candidates interested in the careers, um, career pathways within the industry, but also ensure that employers are partners with the right fit for their business. So businesses who wish to participate in the Australian apprenticeship system but need um, assistance with uh, other elements, utilising a group training organisation, as I as mentioned before, they are often called GTOs, may be a good option. GTOs employ Australian apprentices them out to different businesses uh, on a short or long-term 
basis. The GTO takes on the contractual and administrative responsibilities of an employer. They recruit the trainee, provide support with work and training for the trainee and host employer and the host employer as well um, for the full term of the uh, contract. To, um, to get in touch with a uh, GTO, um, contact your asset and he'll be able to connect you with the one that fits your business need. So we've um, seen that once our employers launch their training program um, and have trainees go through the pathway, it then becomes part of their recruitment strategy long term. It continues to improve and it just keeps going. Once we identify your new trainees um, to be signed into traineeships or existing employees looking for upskill, we can facilitate the whole process for you. So we assist you with eligibility advice, um, training contract sign up, as Tom mentioned earlier, and administrative support, um, with processing um, for more government incentives and wage subsidies for you and your trainees as well. Um, we maintain regular contact with you and your trainees from the sign up right through to completion and completion of the traineeship. We have mentors through our in training services. Um, and they can assist you with a variety of issues ranging from any workplace, uh, workplace issues, um, training issues, personal, cultural, financial and health issues and many more. Um, just a reminder that um, the service uh, through the in-training is um, free for employers. And we are contracted by the Commonwealth Government. Um, uh, a lot of our mentors have qualifications in community services. Many of them also hold degrees and members of the team have uh, specialist um, areas of expertise as well. So um, there are truly many benefits of the uh, traineeship pathway for employees and their experienced employees, financial and non-financial. Just to recap a little bit on a few that um, Tom mentioned earlier, you gain a fully qualified um, employee who will learn your business your way and can help as well. Um, increase productivity um, in uh, skills in the workplace as well, improve satisfaction for your staff, engagement and retention, which, which has a significant um, cost saving, um, and access potential government financial incentives as mentioned earlier. If you would like to know more, um, there is a contact number listed below. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out and discuss how we can help you get the program and up and running in your organisation. We're happy to also keep you in the workplace. So I would like to now hand over to Alex Phillips, who's the Director of Friendships and Network Operations um, with the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations. Um, Alex will introduce the Employment Apprentice guest speakers and MC the Q&A session. Thanks, Liliana, and hello, everyone. So now we're going to hear from two employers who will talk about how they use apprenticeship pathways as part of their overall recruitment strategy. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Andrew Jamison. Um, he, he's been with Benetus for eight years and his current role now includes talent acquisition, employee experience, learning and development, recognition and reward, leadership development and performance management. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you. And our second speaker is Cassandra Hurst. She's the VET coordinator for Australian Unity, supporting the business in scoping and implementing vocational programs, which may be traineeships, qualifications and or skill sets. So thank you both for joining us today. I'll hand over to you first, Andrew. Thanks, Alex. Um, Fantastic opportunity to, to share the Benitas story with you all today. Um, so I'm really uh, appreciative of the invitation. Um, we actually started this journey before COVID uh, with, our, with our pilot program in residential services, residential aged care. And this year we actually expanded into the community health and care space. So for, um, uh, people supporting uh, clients in their own homes, and and I believe that's that's something that's quite uh, quite unique. Being able to develop a model that works in that space. Um, the one thing I'd say uh, as as we sort of get into this is um, the Benitas model is an employment model, not a training model. So we come at it uh, from we have a number of facets around how we support. 
um, employees uh, who who are undertaking a traineeship. So, um, and I concur with, uh, I think the data that Tom put up, our retention is certainly, I would say it's above even the uh, the, the average um, across the sector. We, we've had a lot of success. So um, the key components, as I said, uh, we call them, um, Sparkies, which is a bit un unfortunate, they're, they're not electricians, but um, uh, the idea was we called, we brand it the Spark program because we, we want to spark an interest in, in aged care and spark a career in aged care. Um, it's It has a number of components to it. It's a true, for, for the learning and development devotees in the audience, it's a true 70-20-10 model. So it focuses very much on learning through experience with appropriate support from others and then we we overlay the certificate three and other formal training that Benitas does. Um, we do have a, an external consultant that we use that helps us to coordinate um, the overall program. They find the candidates, um, they do some uh, screening for us before we see them. They help us with wage subsidies and they uh, coordinate all the external parties, including um, the RTOs that we use. Um, and I think the last thing there is that I wouldn't underestimate if you're going into this, it's a very big culture change. Um, you're bringing unqualified people with no experience into the business and you've got to really think about how you go through that that process and for us we used to hear the language of students all the time from our leaders and and that was a signal that we hadn't quite sort of nailed the culture shift because uh, as I said they're, they're employees. All right we'll go to the next slide. So this is just a visual of our of our model. Uh, the first thing I'd say is it's a funnel not a tunnel um, so those two orange lines sort of indicate that we uh, we start with a, a large number of candidates and we go through some steps that the, the front end we move very quickly through an initial uh, visit where they get to uh, either go to one of our home care offices or go to a residential aged care home, see what it's all about, hear from people that, that work in, in that environment. And then we have basically speed dating interviews um, if we love them and they love us, we uh, go to the next step and we give them ex an experience um, uh, where they can actually see the job in all its glory, um, see what, what the work environment's like. Um, and again, if we, we both are still keen, um, we offer them a job. And that, that process can happen in about a two week period, ideally. Um, and then uh, I guess probably the other the other main thing to, to call out is once they begin employment with us, and we've got two different versions, it does work differently between residential services and in the home care space, but they, they both have the 70-20-10, the, the work, the, the mentoring, the buddies, um, and then the formal training. Um, in uh, residential services, each person is, um, supernumerary so uh, working with a buddy for eight to 12 weeks it is an individual thing about us determining when they're ready to be independently rosterable and we've got a way that we we measure and track that um, it's not quite so linear in the home care space because there's lots of different types of shifts so they can be you know doing independent domestic assistance shifts for instance whilst they're still being buddied to do home care shifts. Um, and then of course, the, the certificate three through our RTO partner, um, and we sort of define um, what electives we want covered. We define the, um, the way it's delivered and then we, we integrate the assessments into, um, into the way we work. Um, I think the only other thing I'd mention is, um, We've got a trainee rate for residential in our enterprise agreement. Um, our home care trainees start off on an unqualified rate, um, but we've got a progression in, in both cases. Uh, all right, we'll go to the next one. So um, just the last point from me, um, the key success factors, gee, you know, leadership's massive. Um, it's if you've got the right leadership, um, 
this this can really succeed. There's support from other members, so our team. Um, it's really myself, and I've got I've got one team member who works on uh, the Spark program, probably 0.5 FTE. Um, our, our buddies and our clinical leaders. Uh, we've got a great structure in our community health and care team, where we've got senior uh, personal care workers, for want of a better phrase, who who mentor and buddy um, the the new new folks until they're ready to to go it alone on the roster. Um, you've got to have your regular feedback and and coaching because um, they are starting from scratch and uh, make sure your, your rostering's consistent and, and predictable and you know that as they they go onto the roster then they they just hopefully just pick up the shifts that they've been buddying on um, over time and then you can sort of expand from there we use a technology where we uh, monitor and track feedback um, the ideal for us is that there's feedback on progress logged weekly um, and our uh, our mantra is to fail fast. So we want to give people the, the opportunity to improve, but we do move quickly at the beginning. So we use probation then to really make sure that this is right for us and it's right for the individual. If if things aren't happening, um, we take all the steps we can to support them to succeed. Um, but at the end of the day, sometimes it's not the right fit. Either they self-select out or, or we make the decision. But um, we, you know, at the moment we've we've got about 21, 22 trainees at the moment. We're in the the middle of taking on the next group, the the first step, and uh, that's probably going to be another 20 or 30 at least. Um, and we we're going to be doing that every few months. Um, so yeah, exciting times. Thanks for the opportunity to to share our story with you. Um, now I'm going to hand over to Cassandra Hurst. Cassandra is the VET coordinator for Australian Unity. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. Thanks all. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, um, how I'm going to fit all my information into five minutes, but uh, we can talk about it all day. Um, but yes, look, um, my name's Cass. I'm uh, the VET coordinator at Australian Unity. Um, Australian Unity, by way of background, uh, we have over 6,000 uh, 6, uh, employees nationally across Australia, um, and the business comprises of um, home care, residential community and facilities, dental, health insurance and financial products. So, uh, yeah, it's quite a scope of, um, of, of broad products there. Me in particular, I work in our vocational education and training team. So that's what VET stands for. Um, reason uh, we're the VET team, not the traineeship team, is because we're expanding into other sort of accredited programs, not just traineeships, uh, in terms of um, you know, ensuring we've got lifelong learning happening over here at Australian Unity. So my team consists of me and three, uh, three other staff that um, we manage all the accredited programs across the organisation. Okay, So that includes the traineeship program, which is, is the largest. The current program delivery, so that's our care worker traineeship program. So that's the guys doing the certificate three in individual support. Um, look, it's it's a big program. Typically, the majority of our participants are in New South Wales. We do have some in Victoria. Um, currently, uh, we've got 160 active uh, trainees at the moment, but since uh, the start of sort of the journey, the COVID journey for us, um, since January 2021, we've uh, enrolled 283 individuals into the care worker traineeship. So we model it over 12 months and it's a blended delivery. So that's a combination of face-to-face -face and virtual classroom with some workplace observations as well. So the way we pattern that into the, to the rosters is it's a three hour fortnightly class. So a virtual class with um, our chosen training partner. And then on the alternate week, they have three hours study time, which can be rostered however the business unit wants to do that uh, for them to get, get together all their assessment tasks and things like that. Um, we also have three full face-to-face -face days throughout the 12-month program, and that's to get through all the practical aspects of the certificate. Um, our partnering uh, registered training organisation, they're very flexible. They've worked with us for a long time. They understand the business. Um, and I, I feel like it needs to be pointed out, a close working partnership with your training provider is really key to the success of the program. Um, you really need to be working almost as a unified front uh, with constant communication. Something uh, something we've, we've got in place, um, as you can see, a lot of 
the traineeships we're doing are actually in uh, the home care space. So we've got people out there in the community delivering home care services. So we needed to look at, okay, well, what supervision have we got in place as an employer as these guys are under a traineeship model? So we've put in place, uh, we call it a supervision passport. And uh, the supervision passport actually has, um, uh, it's designed to demonstrate and validate the on-the-job training that's happening, the supervision, whether that be direct or indirect, uh, and then also tracking a monthly meeting as to where the trainees are at with their, with their learning. So um, the activities in the workplace are critical to enable the care workers to become competent within a safe working environment. So our, um, the way we've modelled it is it's a monthly meeting with their workplace supervisor, uh, which is usually their direct line manager, uh, just to do a check-in, uh, to go through where they're at with the course, uh, is there, are they feeling competent, to go through those individual either uh, knowledge areas or skill areas and check those off to see whether they're competent or not yet competent. So we have that tracked and that, that's on, on a Word document at the moment, but we have some uh, some plans to actually put that in our LMS uh, to make it easier for the managers to uh, to get that filled in. Uh, another big another big part of, uh, I think, the success of our model is we have an in-house mentor. Um, so our in-house mentor at Australian Unity uh, is an experienced person from the aged care industry. So um, she's been with us uh, for a long time, uh, you know, has worked in residential, has been a manager, so she knows the ins and outs of, of the job. So where we're finding that the most value has been given is uh, you know, uh, she can actually assist our students uh, with taking the, the formal learning and then being able to um, apply it to workplace scenarios at Australian Unity to assist them with gathering up their, um, their questionnaires or evidence or tasks for submission to be marked competent on the units that they're working through. So we find that even just having that person there, or like a knowledgeable, experienced person from the industry for them to access outside of their uh, manager's uh, day to day, it's been a, it's been a bit of a game changer for us because we, you know it can be really difficult, especially if you're someone that hasn't done any formal learning in a long time, uh, to be able to sort of take that information and be able to um, articulate how that actually applies to you day to day. So um, we've found that that has really assisted us with retention. Um, with um, support for those trainees, they feel connected, they feel supported, uh, and then subsequently they'll get through to the end of the qualification, which is which is the end game for us. Challenges, okay, well, <laughs> there's been a few challenges over the last couple of years. Um, prior to 2021, um, we did almost a, a pure face-to-face -face delivery model. Um, We've moved to the blended model throughout COVID. It was virtual, uh, and um, so we found that you know that's a little bit difficult. People that you know sitting in a classroom face to face, moving our care workers to um, a digital classroom, you had some issues around sort of digital literacy um, and engagement and not feeling as connected. Um, however, it does provide uh, a unique opportunity because our home care workers are spread all throughout the state. Um, they get to engage with their peers from other areas, sharing those experiences and ideas. So it actually has opened up a whole another world to them. Um, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, they would not have the opportunity to connect with other care workers in, in other locations. So again, it's another way for them to feel connected um, to the wider organisation. Uh, obviously, everyone's singing the same song on this one, workforce pressures, um, you know, the care worker shortages. Um, we had other challenges with uh, vaccination requirements, uh, floods in New South Wales, um, which then resulted in barriers with scheduling and time commitment. So um, we suspended, I think it was about 160 trainees at the start of the year. We put a hold on training for a couple of months, um, just for two months to, to give the business some breathing space to get services um, back on track. Um, and uh, I guess for us to make sure we didn't end up seeing those people withdraw from the program, but rather put it on hold so the business can uh, get back on its feet in terms of service delivery and not have the added stress of the training requirements. And then we reactivated those traineeships and those guys are, are completing uh, as we speak. So um, all we did was extend their program out. But again, from Australian Unity, we want to see them get through to completion and we will do whatever it takes to support them to that end. Plans for the future. I'd like to say that um, Australian Unity, uh, looking at Andrew's model, it's we don't provide the traineeship uh, as part of the employment model. It's more, they're in the business, they've been working for a certain amount of time, then their managers will nominate them for the traineeship. Then we run information sessions with the care workers to say, hey, this is actually what, what's involved. Uh, and then if they still wish to proceed from there, then we move on to the sign up stage of the process. So that's where we get our fluctuations in, in our numbers. Um, 
with our next intake, we've actually got uh, 115 expressions of interest. Um, we ran three information sessions uh, this month and we're expecting about 90 to sign up into the CERT 3 individual support. So that is a fantastic result. Um, reason we're seeing such a large number is we've actually opened that up to our existing employees. So um, might have uh, been mentioned earlier, but with the changes that came into the incentives program 1st of July, um, there's an opportunity for us to um, put through our more experienced care workers uh, through the CERT 3 opportunity um, and receive the 10% the wage subsidy to support the, the cost to the business. So that has been fantastic and we've had a massive intake up, uptake of that. So I'd say out of the, the group that's going to uh, be signing up, we're looking at about 70% are existing employees and then 30% are new for this round. Whereas over the last year and a half, it's been just people that have been in the business less than 12 months. So it's a really great initiative. Another thing that we're, we're looking to really hone in on is the apprentice bonus payment. So I um, believe that's also another reason we've received quite a lot of expression of interest. So our, our guys are part-time, so it's a pro rata amount of $625 at the six month and 12 month point of their program. Um, so I, I feel like for us that is adding to um, our talent attraction strategy, um, our employee value proposition, and obviously, retaining those people over the duration of their course is more likely due to not only getting a, a fully paid for and supported qualification from Australian Uni but also picking up the apprentice bonus along the way. So for us it's really that we'd love to be able to say okay everyone that comes on board as a care worker if you don't have a Cert 3 we will offer you that. That's where we want to move it to but we need to strike a balance between you know as I said using that Cert 3 uh, as you know a, an attraction piece um, an employee value proposition and a retention piece, but also needing to deliver those core services out in the community and not have an impact on our customer as well. Um, yeah, so that's me. Um, that's really all I have for now. Uh, so I'm going to hand over um, back to Alex. Uh, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Cassandra, and thank you, um, Andrew. So I want to remind people, if you've got any questions, to please put them in the Q&A box. And we will be asking panel members uh, those questions after the session that's about to come. I also wanted to remind people that this, um, this webinar is actually being recorded and will be made available to people. So now we're going to hear from two apprentices who have undertaken an apprenticeship pathway as part of their career journey. Firstly, we will hear from Alex Jones, one of the VET alumni from the School Based Apprentice Awards in 2010 and her exciting career journey in the health and care sector. So welcome, Alex. And also welcome to Victoria Bug. Victoria entered an apprenticeship pathway as a mature age apprentice. Victoria won the New South Wales Training Awards 2022 Illawarra and Southeast New South Wales region and the Dot Hennessy Commitment to Vocational Education and Training Award, acknowledging individuals who have overcome adversity while showing outstanding perseverance and commitment to training. So welcome, both of you. Uh, so hello everyone, my name's Alex. Uh, thank you so much for giving me some time to speak today. Um, as uh, the other Alex alluded, uh, I began my uh, rather long career uh, in health in aged care. Uh, so in 2009, as part of my year 11, uh, I started a certificate three in aged and community care as part of a school-based traineeship. Um, it took me two years, 2009 and 2010, so also the years of my HSC. Uh, it was included in my HSC. Uh, and so the way it was sort of organised was that Mondays were spent at TAFE, uh, Tuesdays through Friday at high school, and I would work um, out of those hours in a high care uh, nursing home as well. Uh, it was really one of the most beneficial steps I've taken in my career so far. So the benefit for me were quite numerous. Uh, number one, it was counted towards my HSC. Number two, it was paid employment, which was uh, very beneficial as I was living out of home at the time. Uh, number three, it started uh, my love for healthcare. So I was able to work with, um, as we all know, one of the most vulnerable people, groups of people in our community. Um, I learnt incredible skills in terms of basic nursing care, um, patient interaction, family interaction, uh, time management, and all sorts of things that have lent very well into my future endeavours in healthcare. 
um, it was a wonderful accreditation to gain. So by the time I finished my HSC, I'd already gained my certificate three in aged and community care, which then allowed me to work in aged care while I was undertaking university. Uh, it also helped me get into university. So I was very lucky to gain early entry to several universities based on my extracurricular activity, including my uh, school-based traineeship. Uh, I was very lucky that in 2010, I was named the New South Wales School-Based Apprentice of the Year uh, and the runner-up Australian School-Based Apprentice of the Year, uh, which also let me um, do some quite interesting extracurricular things as well and um, entered into public speaking and quite a few other avenues. So really incredible and inv invaluable experience for me. Uh, so taking forward, 2011, I started university at Charles Sturt in Bathurst. I completed my Bachelor of Nursing after three years, uh, during which time I worked, I continued to work in aged and community care. So in all, I worked in aged care from the age of 16 to just before I finished university, so five years in total. Um, which meant that by the time I started working as a registered nurse, I had incredible skills, um, as I said before, in, in basic nursing care, time management, um, client interaction, but also more developed skills like dealing with palliative care, uh, losing patients and dealing with that kind of vicarious trauma and grief, uh, and working in a multidisciplinary work environment, which were all incredibly valuable and really helped me enter into the registered nursing field with much more confidence and skill. Um, moving forward from there, so I spent uh, six months in the surgical and then went straight into ED. Um, after a year and a half, I specialised in critical care. So I did a graduate certificate in critical care nursing. Uh, from there, I specialised further in uh, emergency assess and became a, sort of, um, an experienced high skilled uh, senior emergency nurse. Uh, I then completed in 2019 my graduate diploma in midwifery and became a registered midwife, something I'm exceptionally proud of. Uh, and then since 2020, I have been working as a flight nurse with the Royal Flying Doctor Service south in uh, Queensland, southeast in Queensland. So um, in my eight years of, as a registered nurse, I've done quite a few different things and specialised uh, and obviously quite a dynamic area, range of areas. Um, and though I don't directly work in aged care anymore, I obviously am still very much in contact with the aged care sector. Uh, a lot of our patients in, in critical and acute care come from aged care facilities or have links to aged care services. Um, and so we're really quite impacted by uh, the limitations and the struggles that you go through in the aged care sector in terms of gaining skilled staff members and skilled workforce and also staff retention um, and the care that, that is then provided to our um, your residents and clients. Um, I know that directly I've helped influence quite a few different people going through uh, high school and university to become involved in aged care as um, a stream towards university and then uh, further education in healthcare. And I can definitely attest to the fact that um, it's incredibly beneficial, not only for the trainees themselves, but also for the work environment, um, for your staff members and also for your clients that you're working for. Um, I think it, there's something incredibly valuable and innately um, responsible about bringing the younger generations into the aged care sector. Number one, you know, we have an ageing workforce um, and bringing people into that workforce at an earlier age increases the likelihood that they'll be retained there and therefore be involved in that sector for a longer period of time. Uh, it also enhances your ability to bring in a skilled workforce. Um, and of course, significantly benefits your residents and clients in terms of providing high level skilled care. Uh, and on a, pers on a purely human level, I think involving intergenerational interaction in the care environment is incredibly beneficial for wellbeing um, and holistic care of, of your residents and clients as well. Uh, so it's a lot about me, but uh, from a personal perspective, my, my commencement in aged care was pivotal in progressing myself throughout my career and has allowed me to establish myself as a registered nurse and midwife very thoroughly and, and really given me some incredible skills that I continue to utilise to this day, but a half a time, a half a lifetime after starting in aged care to begin with. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have about the benefits of school-based traineeships and the implications of school-based traineeships and how you can support students uh, to undertake those. Um, but for now, I'd like to pass it on to Victoria Bug um, and congratulate Victoria on her achievements this year as well with her awards.
Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I've been working with Australian Unity since returning home in oh, 2020 after travelling around Australia and working on cattle stations as a cook. Uh, it was my daughter who suggested I go into care and support sector as it would suit my nature. I was amazed at how I blossomed in the job, caring for people in our community, supporting them in the different daily tasks that helps them to live independently in their homes. I first heard of our um, traineeships at Australian Unity at our team meeting. I was interested in completing the traineeship that would equip me with the knowledge and skills to become the great care worker. The traineeship also gave me the certification in individual support that a lot of the customers were asking for. So what did my traineeship look like to me? Well, it gave me a chance to work and train at the same time. At the time, it was like a win-win situation for my employer and for myself. My employer got a committed and passionate employee and myself, I got a great job and I got training security. Working together with the Australian, well, it's the Apprenticeship Support Network provider, MEGT, and with Australian Unity, we have a trainee support team. I was able to receive support whenever I needed it. And no question was ever too small to ask. Uh, what else happened? Uh, appointment times were allocated to go over any questions and to talk about how I was going myself, to talk about work, to talk about what I might be struggling with personally. It was just good to know that I could call any time. I was doing the traineeship while we had COVID on. So it was once a month online, we would be with our trainer and we'd go through a new module raise any questions uh, that we might be having um, problems with to complete assignments. Then we had three hours per week to have study time. Uh, that time it was valuable because we were able to talk and we were all on Microsoft Teams and we could talk about how things were going in class, what people were struggling with, especially if it came to uh, questions with our assignments. So looking back at my goals in life, and what and my work goals. I had fulfilled them behind, beyond my expectations of myself. The opportunity my employer gave me was life-changing and I'm forever grateful. I set a career goal to become a care worker coach with Australian Unity and recently I have done that. And by completing my certificate three in individual support and my passion for caring, it gave me the right path that led to my training as a care worker coach. When I finished my certificate, I was nominated for trainee of the year with the Illawarra and South East Region New South Wales Training Awards. I won the Dodd Hennessy Commitment to Vocational Training Education Award. How amazing is that opportunity for myself and my employer? That could be you. It's great recognition because together as a team, we do it. Uh, we also put in an article about myself and what I went through and uh, the traineeship I went under uh, in our quarterly magazine. It's on our website and it's there to encourage and empower other people to come on board to think about doing a traineeship or doing training of some sort to become a care worker. So here I am today, proud and sitting as an ambassador to encourage you all to consider on consider taking on that apprenticeship, to consider taking on that trainee for the future. I believe with all of us working together, we can enhance our knowledge and our skills through the training to provide a great service for our communities throughout Australia. And I wish you all the very best for your future endeavours. Thank you. Is it back to you, Alex? It certainly is. Thanks. Thank you. So I'd, I'd really like to thank all of the guest speakers and can I please invite them all to come back ready for the Q&A session. Uh, we, we already have quite a lot of questions that have come through on the Q&A box that if you're not aware, um, 
please put the questions in the box and if you've got a question um, that you would like to direct it to a particular panel member, then please put their name. So firstly, um, are apprenticeships available for casual workers? I can answer that. Um, Australian apprenticeships can be delivered either as part-time or full-time arrangements, but not casual. Okay, so um, question I think for Tom. So I'm aware of the apprentice training support payment for apprentices is now on offer from the 1st of July. How do apprentices gain access to these funds? So uh, best thing to do is talk to their ASIN. Uh, they should be able to help you um, register for those support payments if, if they haven't already. Um, uh, so um, uh, I don't know really are what the practical steps are about um, putting in that bid, but um, uh, I think yeah, the short answer is get in touch with your ASINs and, and help them to log that uh, application and claim. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so next question. Uh, this is for the anyone on the panel that can answer it. So, are school-based apprenticeships common in aged care? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll start because I've actually met with uh, the um, uh, Victorian State Government Department recently on the, this very topic and we're, we're very keen to, um, to get started. I've always had a belief that if, um, you know, we're really looking for people with the heart for the work and, and I think if you, you've got that when you're, let's say, 30 years old, you've got it when you're 16, you just probably don't know it. Um, so I've done a little bit of work in that space. Um, it, the uh, Victorian government, I think, is sort of keen to support that. Um, we've just got to define a model for how it works. So the short answer is no, they're not common, but hopefully we're going to see them really start to, to take flight soon. In terms of going to and engaging with the schools, we find that a lot of young people don't know how to actually enter into the industry. So this is why um, through our career hub services, the uh, the Asin career hub services, they can engage with the schools to try and promote the different industries, speak to them as coordinators to see if we can um, connect the, the young Australians with our employers within the um, age of the healthcare industry. Thanks, Liliana. Nothing else from the panel on that one? No? Oh, I just say anecdotally, uh, we have come across some businesses that, that um, uh, have a lot of people in the care workforce um, doing ASPAs, um, but I wouldn't know the stats or anything like that, but um, they've indicated there's a lot of people that would undertake different caring arrangements through uh, school-based apprenticeships, but it's just anecdotal. So that may be um, a bit biased by their kind of business model or something like that, but um, we, we have heard that there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of people involved. Thanks, Tom. So question for Liliana. Uh, what courses are eligible for apprenticeship support? Oh, that's so <laughs> um, apprenticeship, um, Apprenticeships can cover many, many courses in many industries. Um, in um, there's, there's quite a few of them. It depends, um, you know, from your certificate twos up to um, the certificate fours, the deployments. Um, we can um, look at the job roles and match the right qualifications with our job role. Um, there's over 500 qualifications that can be done under traineeship and apprenticeship pathways. And in specifically within this industry, we find that I think what gets overlooked are uh, employees that work in um, the kitchens, in the residential cares, um, laundry staff as well. There's there's a very um, quite a few qualifications that we can look into with pathways for you as well. And we find that a lot of employers um, end up identifying um, those employees that go through uh, just ancillary qualifications. They can then go through your certificate for an individual support and grow with the business as well. And I'll, I'll just give a plug to. Two, if I can, there, Alex. So um, uh, we've talked a lot about the priority wage subsidy um, and how that applies to um, uh, um, caring roles, but there is also um, uh, employer um, incentives for for um, uh, um, occupations uh, that that aren't in the priority cohorts. So there's a hiring incentive um, uh, that's available as well. So if you are looking at um, uh, traineeships or apprenticeships that aren't necessarily in those um, 
uh, or, or outside of the care workforce, there is, it is also employer incentives there too. Thanks, Tom. And just may, maybe just one quick point that, uh, um, and I think Cass might have mentioned this before. You know, it's a, it's an entry point to get into to aged care, and then you can sort of branch off into you know a range of different places. And I'm sort of reminded of one of our trainees who started, I think, probably two years ago. Um, she worked for a little while as a personal care worker, transitioned into leisure and lifestyle, and then sort of had this aha moment talking to a pastoral care practitioner, decided that's what she wanted to do, went out and got her uh, clinical pastoral education, which is the minimum sort of requirement, and uh, a vacancy opened up, and probably about a month ago, we appointed her as a pastoral care practitioner. Mm. So, you know, you can get in there and just use it as a, as a starting point to go off into a whole range of different things. Thanks, Andrew. So I think this is probably a question for Cassandra, Andrew and Liliana. What should be the qualifications of a supervisor of a trainee? <laughs> well, there's a formal answer to that, Liliana, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, I guess if I can jump on here, the supervisor, at least they, they need to have um, years of experience with the industry, but also hold the same qualification or above um, the um, apprentice and trainee that's entering into the uh, qualification in the workforce. That's the short answer to that question. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would just say, um, you know, there's a difference between supervisor and buddy. Um, mm. And look, the buddy should meet those same. Uh, same requirements really, shouldn't they? But um, um, the thing I just say is just choose your buddies wisely to our, our friends who are in who are aged care providers. Knowing something doesn't make you a good buddy, all right? So um, yeah, um, there's a whole set of skills around being a, a great buddy and, and having that sort of generosity of spirit that helps somebody grow and, and develop. Mm, so true, and I think for us with the workplace supervisors, it's something that probably isn't mentioned so much because we, we're really central of these discussions around the employee slash trainee, but it's a huge education piece <laughs> to get those workplace supervisors up to a knowledge level, more about the obligations and requirements and how to coach and how to track and how to support your trainee. So for us, that's actually just the same amount of work <laughs> to actually get the, get the programs up and running with the trainee. So that's something that should be noted as well. Yeah. Yep. Andrew, you talked about your buddies. Um, I have a question for you on that. Do you require your buddies to have any specific qualifications? No, only the the equivalent or above. So our our buddies are often, um, uh, you know, personal care workers, or in the case of our community health and care in home business, uh, senior um, personal care workers. Um, that relates to more skills and experience. Um, so yeah, they've got to have at least the Cert 3. We we haven't gone down the track. I think the question might be angling towards Cert 4 in training and assessment. We haven't gone down that path yet. Okay. Okay, so another question for Andrew and Cassandra. Uh, can you talk about attrition rates across time? Do you find trainees leaving during and after the traineeship is different to other staff? Andrew, do you want to kick off? <laughs> I can kick For us, I don't have any numbers or stats in front of me, um, but you know, our experience has been, um, look, if, someone, if someone's going to resign, they're going to resign. Like we find that this, that decision's already made. However, if there's a way for us to intervene through our mentoring service and we pick up on an issue and we resolve that issue. We don't have people uh, leaving the program because they don't like the program. So, you know, we will resolve any of those issues, whether it be um, there's an issue with time release, uh, there's an issue with, um, with some personal circumstances that, um, and also feeling um, they don't have time for it, things like that, or they're struggling with actual course content. So we find when we put those interventions in place, uh, and then work closely with the, the training provider to look at support sessions, one-on-one -on -one sessions with the trainer. We get them back on track and through completion. So similar to Andrew, our complete, I believe our completion rates are actually above sort of the standard. Um, however, I've found that it has taken a bit of a hit because of resignations over the past probably 12 months because of sort of the COVID and vaccination and flood situation. We had a lot of people coming in and leaving, uh, leaving the organisation. So um, yeah, but not attributed to the training. 
in any way. Uh, yeah, look, I'd add to that very similar experience. We, I'm just sort of thinking back over the, probably the three years now, I think that we've been doing this. We haven't lost a single trainee who's gone up the road to another provider. Um, we have, there's probably a few that have gone and worked for Cassandra's business because we've had a, two or three people whose partners relocated interstate with work. We're in Victoria and they, they we, you know, moved to New South Wales, but the great thing is they moved there with a, a Cert 3 qualification. Mm. They're able to sort of pick up a role in, uh, you know, interstate. That's out of our control. We do remember our model's designed for people to, um, to drop out along the way. So, and that's because we move really quickly. We want people to, to just go, this is 100% what I want to do. And if it's not, they can move on really quickly. Um, it's such, it's the big benefit over signing up to a Cert 3, investing all that time and effort, getting to placement and going, oh, I didn't realise I'd have to do that. Um, we'll find that out. They'll probably invest, um, just to give you an absolute number, they'll, they'll kind of have that sort of clarity within about three hours of engagement with us. And they can make that decision about, is this what I really want to do? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Liliana, can the Diploma of Nursing be delivered under the Australian Apprenticeship Model? Yes, yes we can. Okay, I think it also depends on the state and territory, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> yep. um, it's available as an Australian Apprenticeship in Victoria, South Australia and Northern Territory. Okay. Another question for you, Liliana. Um, what are the minimum hours for the Cert 3? Uh, that also varies from state to state. There's different state to state requirements. Um, uh, there's, uh, for example, Victoria's 13 hours minimum for part time. Um, I think it's 21.5 hours in New South Wales. Um, it varies from state to state, and we'll be working with you to check to see state your employees in to try and make sure that we meet those state requirements as well. Yeah. And I think also that the the jurisdiction won't approve a training contract if it's less than seven and a half hours per week. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Okay, question for the panel, whoever can answer. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have to guarantee employment after the traineeship is finished? No, but you'd be mad not to. Like <laughs> that's that's the that's the point, isn't it? Um, it's about um, employment, and um, um, yeah, for us, we you know, I reckon once we get past probation, unless something seriously goes wrong, yeah. our in objective is that they become a uh, an ongoing, fully qualified employee of Benitas. Um, but I suppose it's just not guaranteed after no. conclusion, but you would say, you would hope that it would be you know, suited to the role. Yep. Okay. Um, are there opportunities for people with disability to be involved in this program? Big, big yes. Big yes. Yep. Um, okay. And they'd probably be eligible for the disability wage subsidy. Tom, did you want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I um, just dig up the details. So uh, there is a disability apprenticeship wage support, which is $104.30 per week for a full-time Australian apprenticeship uh, on a prorated scale according to the hours worked for a part-time apprentice. It provides additional assistance to employers who employ an Australian apprenticeship with a disability in a Cert 2 or higher qualification. So um, definitely something to, to, to do if you can take on an apprenticeship with disability. Yep. Um, where do we start if we are interested in setting up a trainee in our facility? I think Liliana, this is probably one for you. Can't hear you Liliana. A uh, little bit. Uh, you better? Yeah, that's better. Sorry about that, I don't know what happened. Um, definitely contact your Australian Apprenticeship Network provider and they'll be able to support you from the beginning of, of the process right through to um, successful um, completion of that traineeship. 
uh, we would look to um, uh, ensure that um, you have all the information you need um, explain their roles and responsibilities um, for your trainee, to your trainee um, within the workplace um, and work with you to um, have that training contract approved so that we can then engage with a uh, registered training organisation to deliver your training for your employees. And Liliana, I'm assuming if um, we have someone who's not um, with a, a provider already, um, probably first port of call would be to go to the Australian Apprenticeship website. And, and um, yeah. help, which was in the slide that Tom, the slide deck yeah. that Tom presented. Okay, um, what is the duration of the buddy period for existing staff? So Andrew and Cassandra, can you answer that one? Uh, yeah, so for us in residential services, it's uh, it averages out at about ten to twelve weeks. Um, that's at about three shifts a week. Um, that they're buddying doesn't necessarily have to be the one buddy, mind you. Um, in uh, community health and care, it probably ends up being about the same before they're fully rosterable. But bearing in mind it, it's sort of a sliding scale of they'll be rosterable very quickly for domestic assistance. So we're thinking about three weeks of buddying, um, and then um, and then sort of a, um, more support with buddies for the more complex types of shifts. But ultimately it's an individual decision. If the person needs more time or needs less time, um, we can accommodate that. Um, our biggest issue is that we were a bit, probably a bit conservative and we run the risk of the, the trainees getting bored. Mm. So they're ready, they're ready to go. They're telling us, so, you know, let me at it. <laughs> it's a little bit different for us as a lot of, with our nomination, it's not, you. you commence employment with Australian Union, then there's a waiting period, then you're signed up. It's a nomination process. So typically these guys have been at least six months employed, so they're already out there um, sort of delivering services with the clients directly. So they don't need that, but that buddying has already occurred as part of sort of their induction and probation period, and then they're moving into the traineeship. So a little bit different for us. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I do have a question. I can't remember, Andrew, if you talked about this. Are you able to share an example of your supervision passport? Was that? That's that's Cassandra. Cassandra. <laughs> it, we, we, guard, we guard the supervision passport with our lives here at Australian <laughs> Unity. <laughs> that's what I'm told by one of my one of my team members who designed it in 2010. <laughs> she said, we don't send it to anyone. Um, <laughs> But really, it's 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 okay. Really, we just break down. Um, we look at the timetable. So look at the units of competency. So there's 13 subjects, let's say, in the Cert three. Um, we break that down into um, monthly. We look at what those knowledge uh, areas are that they need to check off, all those skill areas, and we just create little checklists. And then there's a signing part for for the um, workplace supervisor. So that's as simple as if you wanted to put something simple together. That's really all it needs to be. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so again, Cassandra and Andrew, do you have any trainees in regional or remote locations? If so, how do you ensure appropriate supervision? Um, so uh, for us, we've um, we've got operations in um, in Taralgon and Bendigo and Gisborne, um, <laughs> so regional locations. And yes, we've got trainees in uh, certainly at the moment in Bendigo and Gisborne. We're just about to launch in uh, Gippsland. We, um, sounds like the supervision passport similar to what we've got. Um, it's through our third party. We have a technology that, that we use. Um, and But again, the super, supervision and buddying is local. Um, so, and but then I can, and, and my team member can sort of retain that oversight by um, going on to our, our website that we've got and uh, just track the, the feedback as it's being logged and the, and the progress over time. Uh, and, and as I said, for us, uh, we do, I mean, all right across New South Wales, so like Broken Hill or something like that, we, we have branches everywhere, so they're like administrative offices. So those care workers have a connection to their local branch and we, we have those everywhere. So at various times I'll be going in there face to face to have meetings, team meetings, but then there's also the virtual meeting um, schedule as well. So they are supervised indirectly through that. And again, these guys are more experienced before they go into the traineeship. So it's a little bit of a different situation for us. Okay. 
Um, I'm conscious of time and still got a few questions to come. Uh, Andrew, you mentioned that trainees who are new to the industry are buddied for an eight to 12 week period. What tool do you use to measure their readiness to go out unsupervised? Yep, so we have a, um, um, I'm trying to remember what we what we call it, um, but it's quite a detailed um, assessment that the, um, uh, the, the manager in residential services, and then we've got a particular role in community health and care that has oversight, they facilitate uh, the assessment, which is sort of a, a combination of inputs from buddies and, and other people that, that work and directly supervise um, the person on the floor. And it's quite a detailed assessment that they go through. And it's only when we can, um, you know, tick off everything there that we're, we're comfortable that they're, they're ready uh, to be rostered. And of course, you know, we continue to supervise them closely in residential aged care. That's the benefit of, and the, the, the simpler version of doing it in residential aged care, they're not necessarily on their own, they're part of a team. Um, you know, we've really got to get our ducks in a row with community health and care because once they're rosterable, they're, they're on their own with the client. Um, and uh, we still have the, um, the senior PCWs still um, visit and, and uh, you know, observe and give them feedback. Um, along the way as well. So it's, yeah, it's quite a, a detailed uh, assessment that we do, which, which is um, a beyond even the simpler level that we do weekly uh, for each person. Okay, thanks Andrew. Um, so many questions. <laughs> Um, what is involved as part of the position of care worker coach? Are they paid more highly? Do you want to start, Cass? Um, care worker coaches, I believe so. That's not really my area because we, I don't really deal with that that uh, side of things. But um, that's more of a um, the care worker coaches are there to support all care workers, not not just the trainees. So again, you know. The trainees are just part of the employee our workforce uh, and they will access them but it's more the workplace supervisor which is usually their direct manager and that's who's aligned under the traineeship or delegated under the traineeship that's providing that that support and then they have their other supports uh, available to them as as a care worker as well and I, I think from our perspective that senior PCW role in uh, our community health and care business that's what the role is similar by the sounds of it to, to what Cass has, um, that's the role and that's the expectation. And yes, they're more highly paid than a personal care worker. In residential services, um, at the moment, we're taking more sort of a recognition and reward approach to uh, recognising the great work that the buddies do. Um, I'm not gonna lie, the, um, the disappearance of the boosting apprenticeships commencement funding uh, is probably going to shift some some of our plans because it, it was a, a great incentive to really invest in this and 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 there's obviously not as much financial support available now but it's certainly something we're thinking about um, and and we're also looking at defining career pathways more clearly in aged care that's a separate project I'm working on and um, and I think this can sort of fit into a career pathway uh, process for us. Thanks, Andrew. Um, is there an Australian apprenticeship specific to dementia care for aged care facilities? Liliana? So, uh, yes, we do. Um, we've got um, a disability, certificate for disability um, that could be done under traineeship pathways as well. Um, and um, what I find is that a lot of our employees pick the dual the multiple um, avenues that uh, your employees can um, um, go through um, in terms of their traineeship pathway or career pathway in the business. Um, they could look at doing dual qualifications as well. Um, I think it, I'll, one, time for one more question, then we'll need to uh, bring this session to a close. But thanks so much for all your questions. So the last one. Uh, Andrew, do you recommend that staff are assigned with the same buddy for their initial shifts? 
that's probably the simplest way of doing it. Um, if you've got more than one buddy, then it adds complexity in terms of consistency of message, communication, and then the feedback coming the other way. Um, although I must say then the, the benefit of, of having more than one buddy is you get richer experiences and, and skills being shared. So um, I wouldn't necessarily say no to, to doing it. I think it's just, you've got to be careful about setting it up correctly. Uh, and we've had a few adventures along the way of where there's been um, mixed messages um, from different buddies. Uh, so yeah, you just got to line all that stuff up and then I think it can be really good. Great, thank you. So I'm now going to bring the uh, Q&A session to a close. I'd really like to thank Alex, Cassandra, Andrew, Tom, Victoria and Liliana for being part of the panel and for presenting. Thank you for the information you've provided and also for the personal experiences that you've shared. Um, I'd now like to hand back to Emma to close this session. Thank you all. Thank you. And I, I would also like to extend my thanks um, from the Department of Health and Aged Care to the presenters and guest speakers for joining with us today. Um, just a plug um, for one of our programs. So the Aged Care Registered Nurses Payment um, will be open for applications um, from the 1st of November this year and will close on the 15th of December. Um, I encourage employers to apply for the funding for their registered nurses um, subject to the eligibility requirements. If you've got any queries about the program, um, the email address is on the screen. Um, also, um, I would encourage um, people who on the call who haven't already done so to visit the department's aged care engagement hub. Um, this gives you information about how you can be involved in broader aged care reforms. And finally, um, the presentation uh, and recording of the webinar will be available on the department's website shortly. Um, we value your feedback. So um, once this um, presentation ends, um, you'll be able to uh, fill out a short survey. And as I said at the beginning, um, it's really great um, if we can get your feedback on the um, effectiveness of these seminars and also any future topics you'd like us to cover. Um, so once again, um, thank you all um, for attending. I hope this um, webinar was really useful and you know who to go to um, if you're interested in um, uh, uh, joining the Australian Apprenticeships Program. Thank you everyone, have a good day.